right now we're doing the intros of the panelists. Um, so I think that we will start with, where did I put that? Um, Peter, who is a human trafficking detective for Snohomish County Sheriff's Office Special Investigations Unit. And you have a few minutes to let us know what you're doing. Okay. All right, I'll start with a correction because I've changed roles uh, oh. recently. That, that's quite all right. So I'm uh, now the search and rescue coordinator, uh, one of the search and rescue coordinators for Snohomish County. So if my phone rings, I'll have to answer that tonight. Um, I still act in an advisory role for the trafficking investigations and I participate in all the undercover operations <coughs> that uh, go on there. So I'm glad to kind of keep my finger in it. Um, so anyways, so I'll talk about what, um, Who's my cue card person, by the way, just so I, thank you. Um, so initially, uh, Snohomish County Sheriff's uh, Prosecutor's Office got a federal grant that would fund a prosecutor, a full-time detective, and a part-time secretary that the sole purpose was to create a program um, that would investigate the crime of human trafficking. So that's how my position started. Um, myself and an advocate, Azra Grudik, who um, works for Providence Intervention Center for Assault and Abuse. Did I say that right? You did. Okay, it's a long acronym. Um, she and I worked together as partners, um, a hybrid model, which is very unusual in law enforcement. So uh, my partner was not another cop. My partner was a victim advocate who is not law enforcement whatsoever. And we worked hand in hand and developed a, a program to respond to human trafficking in Snohomish County and beyond. Um, so inevitably, and I'm sure Tim is aware of this, so even though I was gonna investigate any type of human trafficking, inevitably it boiled down to sex trafficking and sex trafficking of juvenile females. That's because I'm not saying that there is not other trafficking going on, but that's the bulk of it. And that's the, um, I would say the most prevalent type of trafficking here in Snohomish County. So we developed a program, kind of a five prong approach, and it's a victim centered approach. So just like uh, that cop, I think his name is Andy, and there was saying, um, cops in the past and still there's still we still have a battle to fight this um, idea that this this person is a prostitute who is out there on her own free will uh, to make money maybe for her drugs or, or whatever whatever her vice is um, so there needs to be a paradigm shift and I'm, I'm glad to say that it's it has mostly happened in Snohomish County but it needs to happen over our whole nation where it's a victim-centered approach to these girls. So we don't start out thinking that they're the criminal. We start out with the, expecta the full expectation that they are the victim in this situation. So that's, that's the foundation of um, our trafficking programs in Homish County. Um, uh, our, our approach is to use the advocate um, who's housed most of her time in the um, juvenile detention center she screens all the kids that come in there, and she's an expert in identifying youths who have been or are currently being trafficked and exploited. So because of her expertise, she was able to call out so many victims for me then to, to meet and um, get disclosure from with her assistance. I couldn't do it alone. I'll make that very clear. I could not do that alone. She has to sell me because I'm the cop. I'm the bad guy. Um, and I have to approach it, victim-centered approach, and not look like a cop and not act like a cop. Um, and that's what we do. So by using that approach and reaching out to uh, public entities like hoteliers, school district, admin, um, anybody we can get our hooks into who can be our eyes and ears out there, because there is only one human trafficking investigator in Snohomish County, one. Um, and it, as somebody was saying, uh, 45 cases generally are developed each year, somewhere around there. So uh, we need all the eyes and ears and people we can out there. So um, 30 seconds left. 
you can ask me plenty of questions later, so I'll just pass it on. Great, okay, thank you. Um, so next to Peter <coughs> is Paula newman Skomsky. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. Wow, all right. Um, she's a forensic nurse examiner, uh, which is near and dear to me because 15 years ago when I started with sexual violence stuff, I ended up working with uh, forensic nurse examiners down in King County. Uh, eye opener, thank you for yes. the work you do. Uh, and is the founder of Peoria Home, uh, which provides housing and an array of support services for women with a history of sex trafficking, prostitution, and chemical dependency. So, ready, set, go. So I'll back up just a little bit and talk about what I do at Providence Intervention Center for Assault and Abuse, because that's really how I came to learn about trafficking victims. As a forensic nurse examiner, we provide medical services and advocacy services for victims of sexual violence, physical assault, child abuse, and all aspects of interpersonal violence. And that's when we really first started seeing young women in the emergency room who um, weren't like our typical sexual assault victims. And um, also one of the Everett police officers came to us and also said, you know, we have a problem here in Snohomish County that we're arresting girls for prostitution who aren't old enough to consent to having sex. And so putting those two things together, um, we started a small task force to take a look at what was going on in Snohomish County and how we could provide services to that um, population. So out of that task force, um, we identified that there are services available for minors. They're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but there are some services available. But once a girl turns 18, all of those services go away. And we wanted to be able to provide an alternative for young women who still want to try to exit the sex trade business. And that's how Peoria Home, the, the vision for Peoria Home came to be. Peoria Home, unfortunately, is not open yet. We're still working on that. We're in the fundraising stages to obtain a property and get open. But our plan is to provide a two-year residential recovery program for women 18 and over um, to help them with addiction recovery, trauma recovery, and learn job skills because most people living on the street don't have a lot of skills to put on a resume to seek employment. And we know that the number one need for helping women rebuild their lives is safe and stable housing, which is also not easily accessible. So um, that's kind of what Peoria Home is and where we are with that. Um, and so hopefully you'll be hearing a lot more about that in days and months to come. Great, thank you. And next is Lindsay Cortez, who's the program manager for the Cocoon House Emergency Youth Shelter. So for those under 18. Yes. Okay. Um, you'll have to excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold tonight, um, but I'm happy to be here talking about this issue because I'm really passionate about it. I work for Cocoon House. Um, we work in Snohomish County. We have lots of services for kids uh, who are homeless and at risk. We have a prevention programs so that parents who have troubled teens you know, can get some help to prevent them from leaving home. We have a drop-in center up in Everett um, where any kid can come in and be referred to services and meet with some service providers. We have drug and alcohol counselors there, um, mental health counselors, and uh, lots of connections to employment opportunities. But the part that I work in is really our housing division. So we have four different shelters across Nahomish County. Um, two of those are in Everett, one's in Monroe, and one is in Arlington. So in those programs, we really work with youth under the age of 18 um, who are at risk of becoming homeless down the road, uh, who are homeless currently and disconnected from their parents, who are, on, or who are in foster care, um, just really disconnected families. So. The way that people get referred to us is, uh, you know, their parents call and say, I can't have this child at home anymore, they're out of control, or maybe the, the child's running away saying, you know, I just can't be at home, um, there's abuse going on, you know, lots of issues, lots of really tough issues like that. Um, and these kids really become targets for traffickers, and they are just really easily victimized. So we see a really high disproportionate amount of at-risk and homeless youth um, in the victims of sex trafficking. So 
you know, we've really had to work on how do we work with these kids, how do we provide them services, um, you know, not scare them off with police and things like that. Um, so we've worked with Pete and some other victims advocates to get them involved with our shelters. Um, we also just have a really low barrier approach to working with these kids. We set short term goals um, because realistically, you know, they're not necessarily going to come into a program and want to follow all the rules and stay no matter what, you know, maybe they want to run out the door, you know, they're just in and out. So. We have to really push ourselves to work with them um, to kind of lower our barriers. So what we do is we focus on personal safety. We talk to them about safe situations, healthy relationships. We come up with a safety plan. So if we know that they're leaving and they're going to a dangerous situation, we can help them plan about what they would do, um, who they might call, who they can trust, um, things like that. And uh, we really just help them just slowly get introduced and get connected to resources in their community so that they know that people here do care about them. Um, we have a lot of young girls right now um, and boys who are just really easy targets for, for trafficking. Um, in our shelters in Everett, I've had multiple kids just walk out the door just to go down the street, get a coffee, and, uh, and they come back and they say, somebody approached me, they want me to get in their car and go to another state with them. And it just really surprises me that there's just so many people out there who are willing to take advantage of our kids. Um, and these kids are so at risk because they really don't have the stable families that a lot of us were blessed with um, to know that somebody loves them no matter what, that somebody's out there looking for them because some of these kids, you know, being in foster care or um, being recently adopted and not very strongly connected with their family, um, they might not feel like they have any other option than to go with this person who's offering them all of these great things. So we've, we've got a lot of, to compete with, um, but we've got some really passionate people in Snohomish County and a great, um, a great support network for them. So thank you. Um, great, thank I'm you. I'm open for your questions later. <laughs> And next is Kathleen Morris, who's the program manager for the Washington Anti-Trafficking Response Network, WARN, which is a coalition of organizations in Washington state that provide direct assistance to victims of trafficking. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. I actually am the one person on the panel who's two odd things out. I'm based in King County, not Snohomish County, although we absolutely work up here. Um, and I also, our program also focuses on serving um, victims and survivors of all forms of human trafficking. Um, as Pete was saying, um, human trafficking is not solely um, based around the sex industry or the sex trade. Really, human trafficking is, the, um, is compelling a person into any form of work or service against their will. And so we really work with a broad um, array of survivors um, from a broad array, array of backgrounds. Um, and one of the things, one of the takeaways I always like to make sure people have is that when you hear the term human trafficking, to think more broadly than solely sex trafficking, um, although that certainly is an important issue and, and deserves um, attention. Um, I would say, so globally, um, sex trafficking makes up um, probably be about 20% of all of human trafficking. Um, most people that are, ex are affected by human trafficking are exploited through some other form of labor um, or work rather than um, sex work. Um, and I think in the United States, we certainly have systems in place that are um, more apt to identify um, sex trafficking, but I don't. Th I think actually the reality is that we're just not we're not identifying labor trafficking as much. Um, so our program works with people who are immigrants to this country as well as U.S. citizens. Um, we provide services to um, people of any age, um, and it really is a long road. Um, most of the people that we are working with have been identified as having. Exper experience human trafficking and are we are working with them walking side by side with them as they rebuild their lives after having experienced maybe one month of trauma or 15 16 20 years of trauma and abuse um, um, yeah I think um, just to let you all know, in Washington State, we do see a tremendous amount of all forms of human trafficking, and in many communities, there have been um, have developed responses to the different all the different forms, um, and we work with providers across the state to um, help help them plan and and prepare 
a response to people who are in need. Um, although we are a program that is very much in the niche of serving human trafficking survivors, we also um, talk a lot about how do we break down the barriers for anyone who feels that they've been harmed or injured and is seeking assistance. Um, and so Lindsay and Paul and I were talking earlier about just what do you need, right? It's not about what happened to you. How can we identify what happened to you? Um, but what do you need right now? And so from a service provider standpoint, that's really the approach we take. That being said, we have wonderful partners in law enforcement who understand what a victim-centered approach is, and that when we're working with people who've experienced trauma, um, meeting them where they are and taking, hearing their story in the, in the, on the terms that they're able to tell it um, are really is really what victim a victim-centered approach means um, but also we've learned over time and making lots of mistakes um, that that's actually a really great way to build a case and a prosecution if that's the goal right so to take take it from um, serving a survivor which is really important and to serve them on their terms but also to make sure that the person that who abused them um, pays the consequences for that and isn't available to do that to somebody else so that's sort of a continuum or the spectrum of the work we do. And I would say, though, um, just in the reality of the work, probably 90% or more of the people who we serve are never involved in a criminal um, case or never, uh, their, their abusers are, are not ever brought to justice. And that's for a variety of reasons. Um, so I think those are some of the takeaways around the reality of the on the ground reality of doing this work and of working with survivors. Um, and I'm looking forward to the questions you have around the work that we do. Wonderful, thank you. So I think we have about 15 minutes for me to have conversation with you guys, and then we open it up to everybody else here. Um, what I like about you mentioning, uh, Kathleen, the, um, the prevalence of commercial sexual exploitation, uh, you know, sex trafficking versus labor trafficking, um, I, I, I really appreciate that you bring that up because for me, when I kind of wrapped up doing the sexual violence work with the SANE nurses and, and I created a nonprofit around that, which taught me a lot about engagement, engagement with communities, uh, I went to Southeast Asia and did some reporting in Thailand and Cambodia. And I found Thailand to be very Disneylandish with the sex industry, uh, but I started to see a lot about. Um, migration across the borders because Thailand had at the time 90 percent of the GDP for four of the countries in that region um, and then going over to Cambodia I found it much more raw and there I started to understand root causes for vulnerability and in that I saw a lot more about trafficking for labor all these people who were going to Thailand for labor did anybody here read the uh, New York Times piece about the Thai fishing industry anybody okay Definitely look it up. It is amazing reporting. I don't know how they got the access. I started on that and kind of got scared and also ran out of money uh, because of the threat involved in it, and especially when one of the NGOs said that one of their informants was found floating in the harbor. So that's a really important piece that, that really ties something that we use in our daily lives to supply chain and, and you know labor trafficking. So thank you for bringing that up because it, it really is, um, I went in thinking sex trafficking, sex trafficking, sex trafficking, but labor is actually very important here as well. Um, so that's a little bit of the arc for me, uh, doing that research in Southeast Asia, coming back to Seattle in 2009 and seeing that the city of Seattle was looking at uh, trafficking for uh, sex with minors, and it was, uh, I believe, the, the Boyer report, which was who pays the price, I think. Yeah. And they can't replicate this now because they're not arresting youth in King County for uh, commercial sex, but at the time they had data from that, and this was 2007 data, and the report came out in 2008, and they were able to name 238 individual youth engaged in commercial sex, and they estimated three to 500 at any one point in time in King County were engaged in commercial sex. Uh, so that was kind of uh, the, the suggestions made in that report reminded me of what I'd seen overseas and made me think that I could stick around and actually report in my own backyard. So for the next four years, I reopened a lot of relationships and did a lot more research and um, wrote a lot of grants to be able to report on it. And in 2012, uh, wrote a grant to the Alexia Foundation for a photography project that led to the creation of the film The Long Night, which um, hashtag The Long Night, 
and then hashtag leaving the life. And then my handle is at Tim Matsui. So I see all of you have, have diligently turned off your phones and are not tweeting, but if you decide to, um, those would be good things to do. Um, but yeah, I ended up working in South King County um, and created this, this film out of it. And I could have stopped there having this film and having it published and winning awards. But for me, especially because the work I did with sexual violence and creating this nonprofit, I want these stories to have impact and to be able to be used by communities. And one of those things um, that really opened my eyes to it is working with professionals. I mean, these, these, these people right here are the Snohomish County version of who I was relying on as sources and, and partnerships and collaborators while reporting on and, and creating the film The Long Night. Uh, and, and without them, I wouldn't have had that access or that understanding. And so I want these stories that I'm working on to be available for uh, people like them across the country to use. And something here with, with the library system is amazing is that um, A, holding this event, you know, being underwritten by the uh, foundation and having you guys here. So thank you. Um, who here is a business leader? Anybody? Government? Educator? Three? Uh, four? Okay. Uh, just concerned citizens, I'm guessing, for the most part? All right. But how many of you are employed? Perfect. Bring this to your place of business. Um, and this is another one of these things that uh, you know, I, I really kind of want to bring forward to you, what we're going to talk about tonight, um, because of the BEST Alliance, which is bestalliance.org, which is businesses ending slavery and trafficking. And they are working with businesses to educate, uh, build policies uh, and systems for if you see this, you have something to do. And this is one of the biggest questions that I get, and this is what I'm really going to be throwing at these guys, is what can you actually do? Um, a lot of people don't know because there is a lack of awareness around it. Um, and so with that, I'm going to start actually um, with, uh, I think actually I'll go with, with Peter. Um, can you kind of give an idea of the scope of the issue here in, in Snohomish County? And I'm going to just throw some numbers at you really quickly from this best uh, uh, survey they did. But um, there's an initial study suggesting that uh, people are procuring sex online at 2 p.m. during the workday. 63% uh, of prostituted people said that they had met clients on their company properties. Um, in one 24-hour period in Seattle, 8,806 men solicited sex on one of the 100-plus websites available to them, and they estimate 27,000 people solicit sex each day in King County. In IT in Seattle is 12%, transportation is 12%, 12 retail and wholesale is 14%, uh, professional business services 11%, government 10%. Uh, out of the 104 people charged with soliciting sex from minors. So this is the kind of really quick numbers from uh, a recent, recent study done. How does that compare with Snohomish County? Um, what does that look like as the scope of the issue here? Okay, so um, I'll start with saying I'm not a big fan of statistics. Yes, not at all. either. <laughs> and, and then I'll, I'll also say that this issue um, it is so hard, it is so difficult to get any sort of facts and figures about this. This is, this is a problem that, I mean, you think about it, this is the, the pimps pick the most vulnerable people who are the least likely people who are going to speak up and say that they're a victim. This happens in the back alleys. This is an ugly topic. This is, this is not something that people want to talk about, hear about. Um, they don't want to disclose it. The victims don't want to disclose it. So this is, it is extremely hard to get any sort of true numbers about that. So I don't like using numbers. But the numbers I will use is, so when I was doing my full-time position, the three years averaged out to about right around 45 juveniles. And when I talk tonight, I'm, I'm almost always going to be talking about juveniles because that was my business. Um, most, most adults choose not to disclose. Um, and if adults 
disclose to an advocate or whatever, they um, the advocate doesn't uh, have the mandated reporter. Um, they they don't have to do that. So they would have to ask permission from this adult, and adults usually say, "No, don't tell anybody." Um, so that's why I lived in the juvenile world. That's so 45 a year, and those were just the cases that were developed by me and my partner from information <coughs> she got from hoteliers, school administration, concerned citizens, hotline calls, uh, me trolling back page, uh, that us cruising the strip, undercover operations. So 45 investigatable disclosures for 45 individuals about each year. Um, that's 45 too many. So if I sat here and I told you one a year, that's one too many. Um, but if I think about 45, those are just those are just the ones that we happened upon. Those are just, and then not only that, but those are the ones who decided for whatever reason to disclose when they met us. And they ask anybody here, they do not disclose. I mean, it is most people just um, they're going to hold it inside. They're gonna uh, just be quiet to live another day, kind of thing. They're not gonna disclose. So when I think about that, then I just think I'm overwhelmed at how many we missed or we sat across the table with, and they chose not to disclose. And that that number has got to be stay. I mean, it's 45 is staggering to me. So to think all the people we missed is just <coughs> outrageous. Yeah. Um, Lindsay, do you want to kind of maybe expand on that or give your impression of it from a non-law enforcement perspective? I mean, because you're, you're in this immediate place, but in a wholly different sense. Like, they're in crisis in a different way. I guess what, probably when they're, they're seeing you, Peter, they're, I mean, they're looking at the cop or the advocate with the cop. But with Lindsay, I guess they're coming in and seeking services. Do you have any screening questionnaires or anything like that for them? Um, well, we don't screen specifically for this issue, but I'll tell you, we look for um, flags. So any any person that's coming in, we want to see how much are they running away? Are they frequent runners? Um, what's their relationship like with their family? How many cell phones do they have? Um, things like that. Um, who are they talking to on Facebook? Who are they friends with? You know, those kind of things. Um, who do they party with? So just just meeting them and being part of their lives and building relationship with them, um, that's really our goal. And we want to see you know them come back if they leave and know that we're a safe place for them to come to. So I would say you know as far as numbers, it's really hard for us because I don't want to ever ask somebody the first time I'm meeting them when we're doing all these intake forms and they're tired and they're in crisis. You know, are you a victim of sex trafficking? Are you selling, you know, are you selling sex or exchanging sex for anything of value? You know, that, that would turn them off right there. Who, who would want to open up to somebody who would ask them that without even having a relationship with them before? So that's why I've kind of pushed back against putting that in our intake. Um, we do track it through our case management. So our case managers are working with the kids and we're seeing, you know, what patterns do they have in their lives that would lead us to believe that they're involved in something like this. Um, most of the trafficking that we see is really um, kids who need a place to stay, kids who need, you know, other things of value and uh, and they're exchanging sex for those things or a place to stay because they feel like that's the only way that they'll get to be in a safe place that night is if they stay with this person they just met and uh, so that's that's really the kind of stuff that we're seeing and I would say it's a high prevalence if if we really got down to it to ask them um, in some sort of anonymous survey uh, we would see the majority of kids that are homeless or ongoing staying in shelters have had some sort of experience like that Okay. Has the Center for Children and Youth Justice approached you with the model protocol? What did you say? The Center for Children and Youth Justice, uh, Justice Bobby Bridges, uh, have they um, approached you with the model protocol and explained that or not? Or Yeah. Okay. Um, I think all of us have been involved in conversations okay. about that protocol. And, uh, you know, I know that our protocol that we have for Snohomish County is really based around our, our one dedicated detective, which was Pete uh, and the victim's advocate. Um, do you guys want to say anything more about Bobby Bridges? <clears throat> yeah, I think, um, I don't know, Paula might have things to say too, but um, 
I get requests all the time for a screening tool. A screening tool, what's a screening tool? And like people come up with like 20 or more questions for someone to identify whether or not they've experienced whatever it is these people are trying to figure out if they experienced. And as I said earlier, I think the only question we ask someone is what do you need? Mm -hmm. um, and I know everyone wants data and I know everyone wants numbers and I can't agree with Pete Moore that one is enough and we should care no matter what the numbers are and what number would make us care. What is the answer? What's the right answer? Is it a million? Is it a thousand? Is it 10? Is it one? And I think, um, so I think we all get a little bit, you know, it's, it's not about numbers, it's about the stories of an individual human being who's been abused, doesn't have a safe home, hasn't um, seen any healthy relationships in their lives, are looking for comfort and support and love, and may have to find that with an abuser. Mm -hmm. um, and that may, and may create a family for themselves with people who we think are unsafe to them. But we also need to give them that space to understand that, that the system has failed them. Something isn't existing and they're looking for something else because we're not providing it as a state um, and, or as you know, a community. And, I, and so I think that um, CCYJ's work is very honorable and, and I think what Lindsay and, and Pete um, and Paula can speak to is that in every community, the model looks different, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What is the best approach is gonna look different for every community and every individual. The resources we have in King County are completely different than the resources that exist here. Um, the numbers that you came up with, that comes from King County Sheriff's Department, the Prosecuting Attorney's Office, and Seattle PD who have in the 20s or 30s of Pete's doing this work and so they maybe can actually come up with some numbers. I still don't think their numbers are really telling the story. Um, so I think that, you know, I think that every community has to figure out what their coordinated response looks like, but every person we serve also has to define that. Um, there are some protocols that say like, you have to get this child, and once identified, you have to get this child in front of, you know, a counselor, a cop, CPS, blah, 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 whoever else. Lindsay and Pete and Paula can all talk to the fact that a traumatized child in crisis is going to freak out if you bring that many adults into their life at that moment. So that's all asking just the, for the details of this yeah. horrific event that they went through. Right, so. well, right. All asking for the traumatic details of what they've been through. So, so what I'm what I'm hearing here is that you really need to listen to your 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 client, um, and that you need time to build relationship and rapport, to truly understand what it is that they want, and then they need to identify and say, I, I want this, right? Is that, is that kind of what, what I'm hearing? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. And I, and I don't want to in any way disparage the work that CCYJ has done, because it's very admirable work. I, no, that's, that's fine with me. I mean, they're, they're, they're one of my partners in terms of getting my media out to stakeholders around the state. What, what CCYJ is doing is working with task forces around the state to develop a kind of a uniform response, <coughs> given that every area requires a slightly different response. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that, that when they go and they try and get policy decisions to be made, I mean, they, uh, they need numbers, but they also understand that it's really hard to get numbers, which, you know, I mean, as a journalist, I've been told countless times, <laughs> good luck with the numbers. I think actually the FBI folks here referred me to some other government entity, which um, <laughs> was pretty useless. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I, and I get it, I get it. I mean, I, I've seen that, that immediacy, you know, and I, um, you know, I, I, I yeah, I, I fully understand. Um, one thing that, that I think is another policy issue um, that, that people have trouble wrapping their heads around is that magic number of 18, which I've seen overseas as well. But you're, you're choosing, I mean, it sounds like you've decided that there's this, this gaping hole that needs to be filled for people who have for lack of a better analogy, I guess, aged out of the foster system or aged out of the youth services system. So can you speak a little bit about those, um, I mean, what you're seeing in that, that immediate sense, something raw, something visceral, something that we can relate to given that we may not actually, you know, have experienced firsthand. Is there something that you can? 
Well, Lindsay probably is, can talk to this too, but because their housing actually goes beyond 18, or what, 21, 22? Not anymore. Not anymore? Mm -mm. Well, it did, so there goes another resource. Um, I mean, kids can be actively engaged in some services when they're 17, and the next day they're 18, and funding for those services for them to continue is gone because all of a sudden, after midnight, you magically have become an adult, and so you don't qualify for services, and now you're choosing to live the lifestyle you're living because you're an adult now, where five minutes before midnight, you're still a kid. And we all know that kids are not adults at 18. Um, there have been numerous studies that show that the frontal lobe doesn't even fully develop until 25 or 26. So, and, and with some people, it's much later than that. Um, <laughs> if ever. Um, so, you know, it's, what do you do with these kids? You just dump them back out on the street and expect them to do something different when they don't have a safe place to live. They don't have education or job skills to get a job. They don't have clothing to get a job. Um, so what do they go back to? They go back to what they know and they go back to the people who abuse them because at least their basic needs were being taken care of when we've said, sorry, we don't have anything to offer you anymore. And I've seen it, and I know Lindsay has seen it, and Kathleen has seen it, and so has Pete, and anybody who works with youth has seen that happen. So. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Um, so it, keeping an eye on the clock here and wanting you guys to have the opportunity to speak with these experts here, um, I'd like to open the floor to questions from you guys. And I'm going to emphasize questions. I have been at many event where I've stood here and, and people have had statements. <coughs> um, this is your opportunity to engage with them and learn something and hopefully, since many of you are employed, most of you are employed, take this home to your businesses, take this to your schools. Who are, how many people have kids in school? Take it to your schools. Um, you know, talk with these, these experts, see what, you, what can happen uh, to, to further this conversation beyond this room. Um, so, anybody have a question off the top? Hi. Um, so, I work for a nonprofit, and I work at raising awareness about human trafficking, and our main constituency is actually grandparents. And what I want to know, because I need to know, um, what are warning signs that I can tell them about? That if you see this in your grandkids' life, or the friends that they're bringing around your house, these are some warning signs that you might need to get more involved and ask more questions and maybe contact authorities. I know, Lindsay, you had mentioned something that caught my attention of having multiple cell phones. What can you tell me to look for that I could tell them? Um, well. I, don't, I know it'll be a little stereotypical to talk about some of those things because all the victims really look different, um, you know, male, female, transgender. Um, <clears throat> but there are some things really that I look for, and that's how often are they running away? Um, are the, how engaged are their parents in knowing where they are or caring about what they're doing with their time? Um, the less engaged the parent is in really knowing how the child is spending their time, I would say they're more at risk because they're hanging out with people that aren't necessarily the people we as, as parents would want our kids hanging out with. Um, so things like multiple cell phones, I would say um, having lots of new clothes um, and no job, like where'd you get the money for these things? Um, that would be a flag to me. Uh, getting your nails done, hair done, things like that. Um, but again, I don't want to only be stereotypical that those are the only things. Um, I think it looks different in a lot of ways. So uh, I would also say, you know, history of foster care, talking about older boyfriends, um, history of sexual abuse, those things are all risk factors. I would also add, like, significant changes in school attendance. Yeah. Um, significant changes in grades and interests. If somebody was... Um, previously very involved in sports or music or whatever and they're no longer involved in any of that and their friends have significantly changed that's a big red flag yeah and the lady's got almost all of them that i kind of have a cheat sheet in my mind but also uh transiency when they're a runaway how much are they moving around 
uh, drug and alcohol abuse, of course, is a red flag. And then bear in mind that a youth can have every single one of these and not be a trafficking victim. Yeah, right. So it's something to always remember. But I, think, I do think families, um, grandparents and extended families absolutely can. Um, I, I think what's happened with anti-trafficking movement is that there's been a lot of fear mongering. So it turns out it's about your kid, right? What's, I'm worried about my kid. What, who's, this, my kid's gonna get kidnapped and forced into sex trafficking. <coughs> I think everybody's demonstrated in their comments that that's generally not happening to um, a child who has a stable home life, who has a safe home to live in, um, who has a family that where trust has been built. I think that parents and grandparents who talk about healthy relationships with the ch children, who are accepting of changes that adolescents go through and choices that they might be making around relationships and friendships, um, those are kids that that don't look elsewhere for support and acceptance. Um, and Lindsay talked about transgender youth and LGBT, LGBTQ uh, youth. Um, these, are, these are children who disproportionately feel the need, are either kicked out of their homes or feel the need to flee their homes because they're not accepted there. Or they can never come out, never be truly, talk truly to their parents about what they're experiencing. And so I would say my advice to adults and adult members of a family is creating a space where that exists, where that kind of support and acceptance exists. Um, and I, I know that's easier said than done, but I also think that that's a message we want to get out to people, um, which can actually help prevent a lot of the vulnerabilities we're talking about. And whether or not somebody actually ends up in a sex trafficking situation, all the vulnerabilities we just talked about are things we don't want our kids to be involved in, right? We don't want them running away. We don't want them homeless. We don't want them using drugs and alcohol, trusting the wrong people. We don't want any of that for our kids, whether or not sex trafficking happens, right? So it's not the only thing, and it also doesn't occur in a vacuum. So those are, and again, not fear-mongering, uh, but thinking about the realistic um, people who are disproportionately vulnerable to this issue, um, and then and looking at ways that you can spread that kind of um, prevention message. I love that you're bringing up root causes again, um, because one of the things that I decided uh, while I was working in Southeast Asia is that trafficking is really just a symptom of greater underlying issues, and those issues are things that create vulnerability. Um, so I love that you really are bringing that up and emphasizing it, all of you. Uh, another question? What is the funding like for this so that we can get some more special investigators and spread them out through the county? I um, had talked with you before the meeting this evening that I had reported suspicion of children uh, being abducted last year. And subsequently, my home was shot at in Edmonds. My dog was poisoned with drugs and, was, uh, and died. And they broke in my home and left tactile knife in the kitchen. And, my safety was threatened, and of course we're all mandatory reporters, but uh, my sense has been that we just don't have enough investigators that are made available to the public to work together. I would love to see Edmonds get a citizen patrol um, uh, group together like Makaltio has. Can you address that please, Pete? Thank you so much for all the work you've been doing. Uh, so. <coughs> funding, of course, it's uh, more of the same. It's do more with less. That's the, I'm sure you all are experiencing that and where your workplaces are. It's the same with law enforcement. The grant that I initially worked under, it expired after two years. That was um, the way it was designed. And uh, it, looks like they, it looked like they were just gonna chop the, investigate, the trafficking investigations position and there'd be none. Um, thankfully, some folks like League of Women Voters and other people stepped in and were my voice where I had none and um, the sheriff saw the value in the work and he's continued it and he's now added another half position so it's 1.5 so um, but that's you know everywhere it's do more with less so unless we got some huge uh, grant from some kind individual in Snohomish County it's going to remain the same. I mean, it really is. The, my admin asked me, uh, I think last month, what kind of staffing do I feel they, um, a trafficking unit, specific unit 
would need in Snoh for Snohomish County Sheriff's Office, and I said six just to keep up, just to do the minimum amount of work. Um, but we could keep 20 busy for sure. Yeah. It's not really an answer, but that's my I answer. just want to add one thing to that. I think for programming too, um, grants are always shifting. So you can start, and you know, the same with what Pete's doing, you can start moving in one direction and you go for two years and you have a good thing going and then the money goes away. So then that's been something that um, really inhibits this work. I think also you guys mentioned earlier some of the other ways in which we can, um, as a community, uh, address this and, and support the efforts. Um, you know, and I think that th this is something that individuals can do as opposed to just writing a check and you know sending it off to the organization or lobbying the foundation or you know increasing our property taxes or whatever. It's what can we give individually, um, and I think free dental services was something that I heard. Uh, you know. One of the other things, Lisa, who was one of my subjects in the film, every time she came into the drop-in center, she needed a new pair of socks, and one time she needed a new pair of shoes. So next time you go to Costco, you know, call up that, that, that shelter. Oh, there's one over here. And say, what do, you, what do you need, like today, now? Budget that into your monthly, you know? Um, or go in and uh, I, I did some work with Youth Care, which is a homeless youth uh, organization in Seattle doing some photos for them and there were volunteer groups coming in and cooking meals for them. They'd bring in the food, they'd do the cooking, and it was their way of giving back. Uh, so I, I would challenge you guys to not rely on somebody else to do it or for the government or for the foundation, but to find out what you individually can do with your own skill set. <coughs> what is that? What is your expertise that you can offer or that you know somebody who can do that? Again, maybe turn to your workplace. I just also want to just address the law enforcement um, question is that if someone reports that someone's being abused or harmed, law enforcement doesn't, we don't need a special human trafficking investigator to respond to that. That's a, their job, right? Their job is to respond when someone's being abused or harmed. So regular old Edmonds police should be able to come out and look at what's happening and respond to that. Um, I don't, and it's not always perfect. I'm on the phone all the time with people who, aren't getting the response that they feel that they need from law enforcement, and I'm not law enforcement, and I can't tell them how to do their jobs, but we should expect that when we call 911, somebody shows up to help somebody in need. Um, and you know, we even tell the survivors when we're talking about safety planning that we work with, like the fastest intervention if you're physically being threatened and immediately is to call 911, because someone in a uniform is gonna show up. So you know, that's something that um, you know, should be addressed, and I would say if you're not getting the response I don't know if this works. Um, if you're not getting the response that you think you should be getting from the local police, then going to the prosecutor's office is one way to say, why am I not getting a response from local police when I call about this issue? So just, just a thought, but I don't, it's interesting that people think we need to have specialists when, when the law's being broken or someone's being harmed, there is a response that's built into all of us who have police and law enforcement in our communities. Is that fair? Or yeah. Not fair? I, yeah. Sort we could fair. talk about this all night. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just this one little. Yeah, yeah. I know. All right, I think we had a one. question up in the back. Hi. Okay. Hi. It's my <laughs> understanding that Snohomish County is going to lease Painfield, turn it into a larger commercial airport, bring in regular commercial flights, and I was just wondering what your thoughts are on how that might influence the sex trafficking industry in Snohomish County, South Snohomish County, and if you had a wish list of what all the, the lease fees were used for, for that land, for our land, what would you ask for? And are you addressing that question to me or everybody? I Personally, I don't think that it would make a noticeable difference in the trafficking issue around here? I don't. Um, for transportation, we're, we're talking about transportation, I-5 is our problem. And it's, it's, our, it's the corridor, it's the West Coast track that uh, pimps generally move these girls up and down. Um, even our local pimps will use just you know a 20 mile section of I-5, so it's not, it's not so much the... Would it influence bringing in more people that would purchase sex? in the local community? Perhaps, but I, I still don't think it'd be noticeable. 
And I'm pretty sure you can, you know where I'd like that money to go. But I'll, so I'll let these gals. Sure, yeah, let's up it to 30. Yeah, I'll take 30. <laughs> All right. Is there another question? I'm wondering um, how many um, traffickers are prosecuted each year in Snohomish County? Very few, very few. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. So my, I, I think Ka uh, Kathleen mentioned it. So my primary goal when I am meeting these gals and I'm getting disclosure and I'm building a relationship with them, I put them in the driver's seat. Um, I'm never gonna try to put them under my thumb and try to solicit information from them that they don't wanna give me. If I, if I do that, I can probably get it. I have enough confidence in my investigative skills and uh, interrogation ability that I could probably get them to tell me a lot of information that they don't want to. But then I've just ruined my relationship with this person. So I really put them in the driver's seat. I think that frustrates the prosecutor's office and the admin sometimes, but my goal, my number one goal, is this victim's safety. It's not to put the pimp in jail. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. So um, she is my priority, and getting that pimp in jail is secondary to that, and when that happens, it's fantastic. So um, of, of just to throw, I mean, you know, I don't like numbers, but I'd say probably only out of 45 cases a year, probably two or three and I don't know if you said successful prosecution I'm just talking <laughs> prosecution yeah. Yeah. and some of those there have been a few at the federal level out of Snohomish County yeah a lot of them are yeah yeah so. um, here here yeah like people who watch law and order think that prosecution and conviction is like the end-all be-all of all of this work and it's so few and far between and it's not because people don't want that to happen it's because we truly want to be driven by what the survivor wants and that might not be it and yeah it stinks that that abuser may be out in the world um, but though you know what comes around goes around yeah. I think we've all <laughs> learned um, through the work that we've done that when our survivors think that their services are conditional on getting somebody prosecuted, that that backfires and that does is that ends up setting us back in our work and disconnecting us from the community that we're trying to serve. So if we really focus only on prosecution, then um, we're missing the bigger picture of what we're all trying to do. So um, that's why, that's one of the main reasons yeah. why. And I think we all know that no matter where we encounter a victim, if they're feeling pushed or pressured mm -hmm. or threatened in any way, they're gone. Yeah. And then we've lost any chance of, of keeping them safe and providing services and getting any information because they are just gone. I think there's a question here first and then over here. Hi, thank you so much, every single one of you for doing this. I think it's really important and I guess my main question is, is that I've done a lot, I've had the privilege and the honor of doing a lot of volunteer work in Seattle and King County around human trafficking, but not so much in Snohomish County. And I'm so excited that there's efforts being made forward to get this out there and let it be known that it's an issue. Um, but what kind of organizations are there for someone like me that's interested in getting it out there and networking and basically being that voice to the community that this is existing and that we need to do something about this. I mean, I don't know if that makes sense, but. Are you talking more like outreach? Like, like more like education? outreach, just like organizations that help trafficking victims. Like, I mean, I've heard of Cancun House, obviously, but um, the PR House is new to me and other organizations of the such. Okay. Um, Cocoon House is really the only agency in the county that specifically serves at-risk youth only. Um, there's probably others that do outreach for homeless populations, um, and I'm sure that they encounter victims of trafficking, um, definitely. And I know that is Hand in Hand still doing some? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so Hand in Hand in South Everett, they're uh, at the community level, 
at a, what's that, Casino Road, and they really work with younger kids, younger than 12, and they kept seeing this population pop up and want to come into their drop-in centers, so they reached out to Cocoon House and uh, ASRA through Providence Intervention Center for Assault and Abuse to ask for how can we approach these victims, how can we engage them, and you guys are really more the experts of how we deal with them because they're more focused on the, the really young kids. So they're doing some outreach efforts. I haven't met with them recently, but I know that they've been involved in all the things that we work mm -hmm. on together. So yeah. I would assume they're a good place to start. There's uh, also an organization called REST that works oh, in Snohomish yeah. County. Um, <clears throat> the Strip Church is also doing outreach up here. Door to Grace is a new one in our area coming out of Portland. Good, a good uh, resource. But of course, you have your own sphere of in influence. Um, so I encourage, like Tim saying, I encourage you to talk to them about it and raise awareness there. I would just also encourage, people ask us about raising awareness all the time and I think it's super duper important, but um, sometimes that turns into a really sensational approach to raising awareness because we have to make people care, we have to make it really horrific. It's horrific. We don't need to add to it. We don't need to create mythology around it. Um, and so I think being responsible in the messaging is really important um, and being, um, sensitive and respectful to the people who find themselves in this situation, um, which I think gets lost sometimes when we're talking about victims. So I think um, just thinking about those things and everybody here um, provides a really good example around messaging with that, but um, there's definitely, don't do research on the internet because you'll, the mm -hmm. stuff on there is really wrong. <laughs> yeah, so just yeah. just a thought on, on that awareness. And I have a couple other things to mention. Um, SeattleAgainstSlavery.org uh, they have a new curriculum for high school students and they're working towards a middle school student curriculum mm -hmm. and they're looking for people who uh, can go and do that uh, as volunteers in school systems um, and one of the one of the biggest hurdles they're facing is getting access to those schools and um, you know it really in, in my experience it's been through relationships with individual teachers or parents who bring uh, that kind of work into schools because administrators tend to have a knee-jerk reaction to anything possibly sex and, yes sex, sex. that's <coughs> yes the three-letter word sex um, I would also recommend uh, bestalliance.org they are doing trainings for businesses I mentioned them earlier um, they are also King County or Seattle based, but uh, worth worth checking into. And then REST, you mentioned, I didn't know they're up in Snohomish County, yeah, but it's yeah. IWantRest.org is their website. And then the Snow Isle Library System will have uh, copies of my film, The Long Night, uh, soon as I get them from the place that's making them. Uh, and then also you'll be able to organize events uh, through Gather. Dot us or go to the longnightmovie.com and you'll be able to host a screening at a local commercial uh, cinema and that allows you to become an advocate for the issue and to bring together a community uh, and and you know go to your 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 people so i think there's a question over here Really quick, can I just say another great resource for prevention um, awareness and training is the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs. They yeah. do um, prevention so. training yeah. and education around healthy relationships um, and human rights. And so I think and that can be really, without having to focus on sex trafficking, they really look at um, some of the vulnerabilities and look at how ways to prevent that and to talk about that in a school setting. The Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs, or it might be providers, it's a P. W C S A P. Wixap. Dot org. I haven't heard yeah, that. Wixap. In a while. I didn't, no, yeah, I don't want to say it. Like that. <laughs> I thought I should spell it. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Agnes, and I've been working with nonprofits and people with trauma and recovery and stability for 20, 20 plus years. And one of the things that I would that I'm glad you had addressed was how the education system plays part in some type of collaboration. I was just wondering, with data collecting, can the schools provide some kind of format where it's a like, uh, anonymous type of documentating, like some kind of trauma, like a list of, I've experienced trauma from zero to five, five to 10. I mean, where one, they're encouraged and hopefully, um, they can disclose without putting their name and having somebody approach them. And then 
hopefully with some type of data collecting um, that's anonymous, maybe that can be a form of statistic and say, look, you know, we don't have the exact numbers, but we are so seeing a growing trend within these school years of people self-disclosing certain traumas and certain developmental age groups. So my point to this whole conversation is, um, how is the school system integrating data collecting or at least providing and um, encouraging disclosure of trauma and sexual assault? My knowledge is that they don't do anything about that. No. I mean, it's hard enough to even talk about the three-letter right. S word, um, but I nominate you. <laughs> yeah. right. No, I mean, I think, you know, school faculty and staff are mandated reporters, so that discourages disclosure in schools. Um, for a lot of people, anyone who understands mandated reporting and, and the response, um, particularly children, I think that um, a lot of, and I, I agree with you, first of all, we'd have to like explain to kids what trauma is, right, or figure out ways to ask question, those questions. I think, and, and from a broad-based perspective, I think having that information um, would maybe really inform the ways that we as citizens vote for and support child-specific systems so that fewer vulnerabilities are created. Um, so I don't think it should be around trafficking or sex trafficking. I think we should be talking about trauma and mm -hmm. abuse and um, safe places and safe Root ways causes. to disclose that, right? Yeah. These are real things that, again, none of this happens in a vacuum. You know, over 90% of, of women involved in prostitution report that they were sexually abused in their own homes as young children. So instead of really focusing on sex trafficking, focus on child abuse and start there because that's where the vulnerability starts is when kids are abused in their own homes and they're looking for a way out. I think that the schools do some survey every couple of years. I can't remember because I don't work for the school, but I remember going to some trainings on it and it's very competitive to see what uh, questions can be included in that survey. Um, and I don't know if they're including any about sex trafficking specifically. I would doubt it. Oh, yeah, Healthy Youth Survey. Do you know how often they do that? Every two years. And how many questions are there, and are they, like, child-centric? <laughs> many of the questions are determined. I mean, there's a large number of questions, and then school districts determine which ones they're going to have in there. Uh -huh. And sometimes all the questions that um, you'd want to have in there to really get a, a broader view are just not going to be put in there. So it's per district. So sometimes districts ask more questions, and sometimes districts, unlike you're talking about, keep it maybe safe. Yeah. yeah. I just saw a series of webinars ta that talked about trauma-informed nation, and I was like, oh, that's such a dream, right? For us all to be trauma-informed, I think um, we talk about law enforcement, <clears throat> not only being trauma-informed because we work with a lot of great law enforcement who are trauma-informed, but being informed about the, their own trauma that's been built up at, over experiences um, and how that re affects reaction. Um, and so just, you know, it's such a dream to think about everybody in our, in our society being informed around trauma, um, how it creates reactions from individually and personally, and also how it's um, affecting the people that we're in, in, um, interacting with. I think in the plaid over here, you had a question? Um, I just wanted to ask about um, the hotels. And um, what I was told was that the hotels should ha would have a, a, some kind of protocol on file um, on how they deal with, um, if they see a situation going on, um, that their staff is trained in how to pinpoint that this is actually going on in their hotels. And if we as <coughs> consumers to these particular hotels go and ask them, um, have your staff been trained as to um, know what to look for if this is happening in their hotels, they are to present to us as consumers a document saying, well, we are on board with um, finding out about, you know, how to um, pinpoint the, the uh, things that's going on in their particular hotels. Because I heard like when a lot of sporting events come around, it really increases on how these people go to these hotels and they should have something 
to show clients that you know we have been trained to sh to um, see these people. Have you ever heard of anything like that? Well, the the Best Alliance does do that. They started with hotels. I don't know if there's anything in Snohomish County, and I don't know what's happening nationally. I just know what they're doing. Um, there's there's nothing standardized like you're saying. I love the idea. Best has been through Snohomish County. Uh, Mar Smith brought the program in, and um, I facilitated part of the training. We had a large number of hoteliers that came in and attended the training, and it provided them the exact information and training that you're talking about so that they could take it back to their staff and things to look for and what to do when you find it, and et cetera. <coughs> um, it, it's unfortunate in that um, the people in that very large room, which was full, represented the hotels and hotel chains that don't have the majority of the problem because usually it's in the the lower chains and they know exactly what's happening in room 203 but hey that's just another night at our hotel and they don't care so there's a real dichotomy there I do have relationships with hoteliers here in the county who did attend the training and we've maintained relationships and they will call the hotline number they'll email email me they'll call me right on my phone and say this is happening right now what do you think and we'll hash it out and I would love that to be standardized like you're saying all the hoteliers who are are responsible and um, I'd love for all the hotels to be responsible but and but I'd love not. for them to put the same interest they have in sex work into good labor practices yeah, <laughs> yeah. I hand, second that hand in hand. Mm -hmm. The work that each one of you doing is just so valuable and so precious to the rest of us who really um, don't have the opportunity that you have to address the victims um, that are involved in sex trafficking. I'd like to know from each one of you, what is the intrinsic value that each one of you receive from the work that you do? Well, the survivors we work with are the very best parts yeah. of our job, I yeah. would say, across the board. Um, and I think, you know, we um, miss an opportunity if we don't talk about the resilience that we see and the strength and the, and the savvy. Um, I'm working with a young girl right now who was never allowed to go to school uh, because of her abuse, and she is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And to you know, see that come out um, as we work together towards a, trying to figure out what that what her life is going to look like is incredible. And um, and really, I think we just get you know that's that's what we get, and it, that's the stuff. Yeah, that's the stuff that keeps you coming back. Reuniting families, seeing people come together who have been torn apart um, because of exploitation. Um, and abuse by other people. So I think, you know, we were really, really lucky to get to do this work. Um, we see some really, really hard things and some really frustrating things, um, but we get to work with people who uh, are incredibly resilient and um, not always grateful for our service, <laughs> and that's important. Um, and I think that's when we talk about victim-centered and um, taking a respectful report, a rep approach is that we don't expect gratitude. Um, we just are here, our doors open, and, and when the person has a need, we hope we can connect them with the thing that fills that need. Yeah, I, I need to echo that. The strength of these victims is astounding. I mean, it is, and I have often said that, you know, when North Korea launches their EMP over us and we have a huge meltdown here, I'm going to go look for one of my friends who has been out there and survived because they're going to be the ones that are just like, hey, this is easy. Um, for me, you know, it's all about the reward is the relationship. That's it for me. When, when, uh, you know, when I get a phone call from one of these gals, just, just to talk, oh man, I mean, that's money <laughs> right there. Yeah. I agree. I've been working with a woman for over a year now. When I first met her, she was severely beaten and, um, in really bad, bad shape. And, she just graduated from drug court. She just got um, five of her six children back out of dependency, and she's rebuilding her life, and it is absolutely amazing, the strength and resilience, and 
to feel like I even had a very small part in that is extremely rewarding. Yeah, I feel, I feel rewarded every day just to get to meet these people that I get to work with and uh, give them a space to just be a kid because that is so fun to see them just do regular arts and crafts and talk about school and what they want to be when they grow up and all those things and I'm so lucky and that's why I do the job that I do. Um, yeah, I've got to be careful with boundaries or I'd take them all home. <laughs> but they're, they're amazing, you know, and uh, so resilient, like everybody said. And, and I just, I have the brightest hopes for their future and I want them to feel that so bad from the community because I think that's what they're lacking is knowing that other people really care what happens to them. And that's what I want Cocoon House to be and all of us, you know, as providers, whoever we connect them with, I want that to be another person in their life that they know cares what happens to them and that we're worried about them when they're missing and that we genuinely do not think of them as bad people because of all the choices that they have made and the bad things that have happened to them in their lives. So um, just a safe space, it's great. Yeah. Can I just say that some of our, you know, triumphs and milestones are not big ones. Yeah. Um, we, we were on the, we got a call from one of um, the subscribers we were surveying about a year ago, and she was like, I'm on the bus. I'm on the bus by myself. I got on the right one. I'm riding my bus by myself for the first time ever. Like, she felt so free, and that was her milestone for that month. Like, that was huge. And I think Lindsay and Paula and Pete all experienced the same thing, where it's not like they graduated from college, right, or they graduated from drug court. Like, those are big but there's also these little ones along the way and we get to be a part of that so mm -hmm. that it's it's really really gratifying and there's these ones that seem small but they're really so big like I was realizing through the talks that we had you know as a group that maybe the relationship that I am in isn't the healthiest for me and so I'm not going to answer that call you know it's like that would be huge that's mm -hmm. That's like ground shaking. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's gonna change their life forever. So just those little little seeds that we plant, um, we probably don't get to see them come to fruition very often. So we celebrate those little things and any little positive steps they can make, even if they take more steps back, that's okay. Wonderful. So um, I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions because what I really love is when you guys get to break out of this sort of like this Thing and and actually talk with with folks. Um, there is uh, coffee and uh, cookies out in the mingle area. So um, I think that'd be a great place for you guys to ask more intimate questions if if you feel more comfortable that way. Um, but yeah, if if there's another one, maybe two questions. And I think have you asked a question yet? Can we can we can we have uh, up front here because she hasn't had a chance yet. Sorry, we'll get them. We'll do two. Hi, I just wanted to ask, we've talked about a lot of stuff tonight, but for those of you that are really front and center with victims, what can we do as community people to help you? Can we donate stuff um, to like Cocoon House and the other organizations? Do you need tutors to help with school? Like what can we do to help? You know, we, not everybody has time to do that, but what can we do to really take some of the burden off your shoulders? Because I know that grants run out and money's short and mm -hmm. squeezing the pennies at everything. So what can you use from all of us that are here? Hmm. That is hard because um, it's a really complex issue. Um, we have a lot of great volunteers at Cocoon House. So yeah, I mean, it depends on the kid or the case. Like you said, um, we could use a lot of the youth that I've seen that are really involved in this long going or long term um, aren't really connected with school so they're home during the day with me and I'm trying to keep them busy and structured activities so any skills that you guys have that you want to come teach um, maybe focus on employment stuff focus on some of the education stuff they're missing I had a girl just want to learn Spanish because she is Latina you know and she doesn't know I don't know just it depends on each case um, also yeah I don't know what would you guys say we need money yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, we all need money, right? We like, do. That's, so, and I know that's the one that people are like, uh. Um, but if you, you know, if you're d making a donation, we have an online way to do it. I know Peoria Home does, Cocoon yeah. House, you can make donations. Um, I would say um, we also take gift cards because we really like our uh, the participants in our program to be able to make their own choices about what their needs are. So we give them gift cards to Fred Meyer, Target. Um, Ross is a really popular one <laughs> um, and um, so those are some and visa gift cards are really great because they can really go you know fulfill the needs of their family or themselves um, uh, I would say um, 
you know, professional services are important to us too. So we yeah. often ask people, you know, what is what is the skill you have? So we, we need pro bono attorneys, um, not for criminal defense, but just like immigration applications, things like that. Um, dental services, um, things that are hard to access, hair, um, hair styling, haircuts yeah. is a big yeah. deal. Anything, any kind of service like that, if you're a yoga instructor, we can figure out how to do a yoga class. Like there's different ways that we can just add value to the things that we um, provide to people. Um, so it's just thinking about like, what do you have to bring to the table? And I know some people are like, oh, I don't have anything. And you do, you do, you have something. And it might, again, it might not be direct interaction. Um, in fact, we most, we really don't connect volunteers directly with our clients just for a variety of reasons. Um, but we, you know, there is a way that the community, we can build community around the populations that we serve. Um, and so we love to, um, talk to people about ideas around that. Yeah, do you I, guys do fundraisers or like like auction type things around fundraisers or need support with your are. fundraisers <laughs> like uh, you know donated space or food or whatever volunteer yeah. support yeah yeah we we're doing a fundraiser an auction in March and we need sponsors and we need procurement of items for the auction and this October in fact a couple of weeks a week from now we're having a, a Harvest of Hope dance, and it's kind of a community awareness event, so you can come out and dance with us and make donations if you'd like to do that, but or if you just want to learn more about the program. So, um, Cocoon House has its annual fundraiser actually tomorrow night um, up at the Tulalip Resort Casino. It's really fun. John Curley's the auctioneer. Um, mm -hmm. Brings a lot of energy, so that's always a good time. And uh, that happens every single year. And then in about March, April time, we have a, a what we call it, our butterfly award ceremony where we give mm -hmm. actual awards to the kids. Um, and we have a big luncheon for community members to come to. So if you guys follow us on social media, then you can know when these events are coming up and participate in them. Um, we also do a big drive, you know, for the holidays to collect things. So if you guys mm -hmm. are looking to donate items or gift cards, definitely. Gift cards go a long way in providing our services because if I need to buy new bedding for the shelter or if somebody, you know, needs stuff when they move out, um, that's where we go first is gift cards because we don't have a lot of flex money to put towards those kind of things. So it's good. And I, I wanted to mention, um, kind of go back a little bit, was you know, what can I do? One thing that we haven't mentioned yet is uh, being a foster parent. Yes. That yes. We were talking about root causes earlier and the most vulnerable. And <coughs> if, if you want to really impact this issue, providing a loving, stable foster home for one of these young people would be absolutely phenomenal. And I know that's probably the most difficult thing <laughs> to do, but that would be absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Good call. Yeah. yeah. Or if you know well, a kid in your community that's kind of marginal and doesn't have a lot of support at home, ask them what their needs are and kind of adopt them, provide yeah. friendship with them and mentoring. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry for the two of you in the back, but you're going to get the one-on-one -on -one with the, the coffee and the cookies. Um, I, I need to, to wrap up this part of it. Uh, definitely want to thank all of you very much for your time. I know time is important. Um, thank you for sharing with the community and for, for you guys for showing up. That's super important and, and shows your, your engagement and willingness. Um, so snowisle.org, that's S-N-O-I-S-L-E.org. Uh, you can learn more about issues that matter. Um, at some point, you'll be able to check out the Long Night Movie from there. Also visit thelongnightmovie.com. Uh, send me a message through there if you want to do something community screening-wise. And then thank you again to the Snow Isle Libraries and to the Snow Isle Libraries Foundation. Yes. Foundations are important. Foundations uh, allow us to do a lot of amazing stuff, so thank you to them. Um, there's evaluations somewhere. Are they on the seats? Okay, there's evaluations. No cookies until you finish your evaluation. <laughs> All right? This is important stuff. Okay, thank you very much.